Well, welcome everybody to Viva's special presentation of Strategies on the Frontline, the Veins edition. Uh, for those that have been to the meeting, uh, Strategies on the Frontline is meant to be a very interactive format. So during this uh, hour, we really encourage you to utilize the question and answer function to interact with the panelists. Just uh, one word about Viva, we're a nonprofit organization dedicated to the advancement of care and health of patients with vascular disease through education and research. So we thank you for joining us on this uh, webinar. There'll be several cases presented to you by a multidisciplinary panel of uh, experts. And we encourage you to, as I mentioned, engage with us and there'll be a couple of polls for you to answer uh, during the presentations. So to engage with us, you go to the Q&A tab on the menu on the bottom of the screen, a window pops up and that's where you can type your question. Don't use the chat function to send us questions. This goes to everyone and we, we're not gonna be able to answer those in the, the Q&A field. The polls will launch throughout the webinar. You'll be given warning when the polls are coming up and you'll have time to answer them and then you'll see the results right away. The event is being recorded and will be available later on the Viva website at the vivaphysicians.org. So I'd like to introduce uh, my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Raghu Kalori, who's the head of vascular medicine, Ohio Health, Riverside Methodist Hospital, and a fellow VIVA board member. And our panelists, Dr. Ramsey Alakim, who's assistant professor at Daughter Institute in Portland, Oregon, Dr. Dr. and an interventional radiologist, Dr. Michael Jolly, who's an interventional cardiologist at Ohio Health, heart and vascular physicians in Columbus, and Dr. Kathleen Gibson, who's in vascular surgery at Lake Washington Vascular Surgeons in Bellevue, Washington. And I'm John Kaufman, Interventional Radiology in Portland, Oregon. So we'll get started now. And our first case is gonna be a case of acute DVT presented by Dr. Alakim. So Dr. Alakim, please go ahead and take the screen. All right, thanks for having me today. Uh, excited to be here with uh, so many different um, departments represented so many disciplines. Uh, um, so I'm going to show a case of acute DVT. Uh, like Dr. Kaufman said, my name is Ramsey Al-Hakim. I'm an interventional radiologist in Portland, Oregon. Um, you know, quick uh, uh, intro about uh, my interest in venous disease. I've always particularly been interested in vascular disease, but more interested recently uh, focused on venous, uh, just because I think there's a lot left to learn here, and particularly on the, the research side. Uh, I think there's, there's still a lot that we can help these patients, and so... Uh, got interested in trying to, to move this field forward to, to better patients, particularly working with um, all the different disciplines, vascular surgeons, interventional cardiology. So I find that pretty exciting. Uh, so I'm going to show a case today of a QDVT that's hopefully, hopefully a little more interesting than your standard, uh, your typical case. So a 63-year-old female presented to our institution about six weeks ago, uh, had a history of stage 4B squamous cell vulvar carcinoma, um, and she came in with lower extremity swelling for about eight hours. She came in in the afternoon. That morning, she had woken up and noticed that her leg was, was really swollen and discolored. On physical exam, she had severe swelling of the left lower extremity with some blue and purple discoloration throughout the whole leg. Um, her DP and PT were non dopplerable uh, and she had a mild sensory deficit in the dorsal aspect of her left foot when compared to the right foot, but no motor deficits. Here's a picture of her lower extremity. You can see the cyanosis throughout the entire leg. And again, non doppler pulses and uh, a mild forefoot sensory deficit as compared to the right leg, which is uh, obviously normal and had palpable pulses. So in the emergency department, um, they obtained first a venous duplex, which showed occlusive thrombus from the common femoral to the popliteal vein. Uh, they also, before um, consulting, just based on their initial presentation, got an arterial duplex, um, which was quite interesting, showed a nice rapid upstroke, but showed complete reversal of flow throughout diastole and all the lower extremity arteries from the SFA all the way down to the tibial arteries. So based on this patient's presentation, uh, we'll start with our first poll and see what people would do for treatment. Uh, just anticoagulate and watch, uh, proceed directly to catheter, direct to thrombolysis, so put a catheter and start TPA. Um, attempt a single session pharmacomechanical thrombectomy with a backup of catheter directed thrombolysis, uh, if possible, surgical embolectomy, or would people obtain more imaging and tests first? So 
So, oh good, we're gonna have some good discussion. So 42% slight majority said that they would try percutaneous mechanical thrombectomy with a backup for catheter directed. Uh, a good majority um, catheter directed thrombolysis and uh, some said more imaging and tests first. Uh, I think this brings up a couple of really good discussion points. Uh, particularly, a pretty significant majority said more imaging tests first. I presume that it would be looking for iliac thrombus, which um, I think is, a, is probably a good point. It was something we considered, but given that it seemed like she had phlegmasia, um, the, the decision was that she would need intervention regardless if she had iliac thrombus or not, um, because the limb was uh, acutely threatened. Um, so we decided to forego any additional testing uh, to bring her in for more rapid treatment. And based on the clinical presentation, it was a very, very high suspicion that there was iliac thrombus. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing to consider about uh, should more imaging have been obtained first. Uh, so we did go with the majority, which was to attempt single session pharmacomechanical thrombectomy um, with catheter-directed thrombolysis. So in the prone position, accessed, um, usually after access to the micropuncture, just do a very gentle injection to see uh, what we're getting into. And you can see here, there's near occlusive thrombus throughout the femoral vein. And then um, <clears throat> here a picture from a venogram of the iliac, and you can see there's occlusive thrombus in the iliac. So uh, lots of pharmacomechanical techniques, um, angiojet, anything. What we used in this case was the uh, Anari clot retriever. So here you can see the 14 French sheath with the nitinol uh, tip. And then here you can vaguely see the, um, uh, the collecting uh, system in the basket. And here you can see it being retracted. Interestingly in this, you can see uh, the superficial, uh, the GSV, the contrast clears when the basket passes, sort of indicating that um, <clears throat> the clot had been cleared. Did four passes, one in each quadrant. And of course, you gotta show a picture of the clot. Uh, so here's the clot that we removed, pretty fresh looking thrombus, uh, not too much organized material. And then here's the venogram afterwards, which showed near complete thrombus um, clearing from the femoral vein but you can also see on the delay that there's not very good washout. Uh, and here on the iliac, again, you can see there was a pretty substantial clearing of thrombus, but not good washout, the suggestion of a compression here. So next thing uh, was we IVIS with a typical uh, Phillips 035 catheter. And you can see that there was a compression point um, right where it crossed the right comb and iliac artery consistent with the Mayferner anatomy. So, Given this pretty substantial reduction in thrombus and these findings, uh, what would people do in the next step? Uh, no additional intervention, um, just uh, conclude here. Uh, attempt a venoplasty only, place a stent, uh, Venovo or Vici, one of the dedicated venous stents, or a wall stent. Ramsey, uh, while everyone is, uh, uh, oh, there it is, go ahead. <laughs> I had a quick question um, before we go to the poll here. Um, sorry to interrupt. What was, the, uh, what was the thought process behind the reversal of flow and the arterial duplex in the diastole? Um, uh, any relevance to this at all? We have a cardiologist uh, uh, on the panel. Um, so, um, Mike, would you make anything out of that? I think it's important. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, when you see phlegmasia, one of the things that you often find is that you have concomitant arterial and venous disease in these patients. So so a lot of these patients with severe arterial insufficiency to begin with, they're, I think they're much more likely to get phlegmatic when you have an iliofemoral DVT. Um, we see this because their arterial perfusion of their leg is already so weak. They may have very low ABIs, and it takes very little to tip them over. Uh, to You know, it takes very little venous pressure to kind of to kind of tip the scales into phlegmasia. So the patients that I have seen with, with phlegmasia, at least the recent two or three patients that I've seen have had concomitant arterial disease. So it's one of the things to think about because uh, I like that you showed that arterial duplex was done because this is almost always what we see from the ER. They're always gonna think this is a cold leg first, which is appropriate anyway, because it's basically the same thing. The limb is at threat and they're always gonna come at you with ABIs and stuff like that first before they think of veins. So I thought that was a really nice addition to your talk. Yeah, well, thanks. I, well, I, and, I, but it was bilateral, you said, right, uh, Ramsey? Um, um, wasn't it uh, bilateral uh, reversal in the diastole? Are we th are we talking about uh, AI aortic insufficiency or? Oh uh, no, no, no sorry. Causes? It was just in the left lower extremity, from all of the arteries, from the SFA down to the distal atrium, the reversal of flow. 
And I actually okay. did find it interesting. I went back to look to see if I could find anything in the literature and I found a, a pretty old paper uh, describing this finding that was previously observed in phlegmasia specifically, which I thought was pretty interesting. Excellent. Um, but her, uh, that's, that's a great point with uh, sort of superimposed arterial disease. Um, she did not have that. Her right lower extremity, she had perfectly palpable pulses and on duplex or vessels, you know, on grayscale, uh, were very clean. She actually had um, uh, no underlying atherosclerotic disease, which is pretty interesting. I was assuming the reversal of flow was because of uh, resistance. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I heard it as bilateral. Oh, so no, I, I yeah, you, okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Actually, to keep us on time, why don't you give yep. us the full results? Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think we went with the majority here, which is to do a dedicated venous stent. Um, so here, uh, sized with IVIS at the external iliac vein, I uh, got 16 millimeters. Um, I, my sort of technique for trying to land these um, as accurately as possible is to find the perfect location to land it with IVIS, take a spot, and then use that as sort of a, a landmark or kind of um, on side-by-side -side screens. I ballooned with a 14 millimeter uh, balloon. Uh, and then this is the final venogram, which shows brisk flow, no further collateral fillings, and uh, good washout here. Um, so this was her immediately afterwards, just flipping off the table onto the gurney. Her discoloration already resolved. The pulses were not palpable, but strong biphasic signals. And then the next morning she had palpable pulses and was basically back to uh, her baseline normal exam. Uh, so I think a, a big important uh, question here is how to manage post-intervention. Um, so aspirin only, aspirin plus DOAC for six months, uh, aspirin and Lovenox for two to six weeks, followed by DOAC for at least six months, or aspirin and Lovenox at least six months. Um, just to make the discussion interesting, uh, she did have a history of cancer, uh, metastatic cancer. All right, so it seems like the majority said aspirin and DOAC at least six months. Um, and then followed shortly by aspirin plus Lovenox. Uh, so good, I think this is a great discussion point. So we went with aspirin and Lovenox for two to six weeks. Well, initially uh, the plan was aspirin and Lovenox indefinitely because of the history of malignancy. And this was one week before uh, the Carvaggio trial came out in New England Journal of Medicine. And so we changed the plan um, accordingly. Uh, typically for stents uh, at our institution, we did Lovenox for two to six weeks. Um, and following uh, particularly the international Delphi consensus, which uh, suggests that that's, that's kind of the way to go. Um, and then uh, DOAC afterwards. So um, I think it's a good point I wanted to bring up uh, with the Carvaggio trial, which came out um, just about a month ago, which compared DOAC, a Pixaban specifically, with low molecular weight heparin, delta parin, uh, and found non-inferiority uh, in venous thromboembolic recurrence and major bleeding uh, in cancer patients specifically. And there were some trials before that has sort of suggested this, but this was the one that, that kind of uh, uh, hammered it home. So uh, we are moving towards this for cancer patients instead of Lovenox indefinitely, but very interested to hear from the panel thoughts on this. I would do I this. agree with you. Yeah, it's, it's the same. Yeah, go ahead, Catherine. I was, I was gonna say we, we uh, uh, in, most of our stent patients we do treat with Lovenox for three weeks at our institution, unless um, some that are strictly non-thrombotic may thurner, um, we don't, because uh, there's no data that you need to. Um, and that, though, sometimes we base it on our findings on venography and IVIS if we, we occasionally will use Lovenox. Um, but always in this circumstance, we do Lovenox for three weeks and then switch over to, um, now with the new data. Uh, with cancer, as, as brought up, we would use DOAC. Before that, we would use Lovenox. So we are a little bit different at Ohio Health. Um, we're, I'm, I'm, I come from a cardiology background, I will say. Most of cardio cardiology is moving away from aspirin as an antiplatelet. So we actually enjoy using clopidogrel for almost all stents. You just plug in whatever stent, whatever bed you want to put there. So it tends to be w more well tolerated in the GI tract anyway. So we actually see, it's somewhat counterintuitive, but we see less GI bleeds with clopidogrel monotherapy than we do with dual or even aspirin. So that's the antiplatelet. We do 
think we need an antiplatelet, and this is controversial and there's no right answer here. Um, interestingly, we've actually gone away um, from using an oxaparin primarily, even after venous thinning, even in the acute uh, DBT setting, um, to using DOAX. Now, this may be a little different because it's a cancer patient, uh, but all else being equal, the patient's a reasonable body size. We're very comfortable using DOAX, and we've had very similar results, which is something that's going to be published relatively soon. It's in print right now. Yeah. Yeah, patients really hate yep. the Lovenox. It's hard to get them to do yep. that. They, they, yep. they love to show you their belly when they come back for their follow-up visit. So yeah, one of we, the, uh, we, we, we have to, sorry, go ahead, John. Well, I was just going to ask you a question about phlegmasia. You know, we, as our technology for dealing with clot acutely changes and gets better, um, I'm wondering whether we're going to be making more diagnoses of phlegmasia. I'm just kind of curious whether people are seeing more of something that used to be pretty rare, right? Um, but it seems, I don't, whether it's truly more prevalent or we're feeling like we can be more aggressive. Um, so just a thought from the panelists, either Kathy or Mike. Um, it's been the same for me. Uh, I haven't seen a difference. You know, we would get called about all of them. Um, we just, the, the thing that's changed is I haven't done an open thrombectomy in almost 10 years now. Um, yeah. So that was what we used to do and it was horrific. Um, awful case, you know. That yeah, I agree. You know, we don't see, we we probably, we have a very busy venous center and we probably see true phlegmasia twice a year. We're not, so we see, we get a lot of calls because the leg always is is congested. It's venous congested. It looks yeah. scary. It all looks phlegmasia. So we kind of categorize these as pre-phlegmasia. They have a pulse or they have a Doppler signal. They're not in an immediate uh, limb threat, but uh, these are patients that we are clearly more aggressive with. They came in for a reason. Raghu, you had a question? Okay, well, well, you know, about the DOAC situation, I just uh, uh, wanted to, you know, uh, state that I, we don't know if all DOACs are created equal either. Um, so uh, without going much into further detail, I think at least at a higher health, like uh, Mike said, uh, we are more comfortable using the twice a day dose drug, um, Apixaben, as opposed to once a day. Uh, those drugs. So, uh, um, like he said, you know, our manuscript um, should be published, you know, sometime here. Yeah, let me just remind all, everyone who's on the internet, um, you can send in questions to us on using the Q&A function. So, go feel free to ask any questions. All questions are good questions, trust me. Uh, don't be uh, hesitate at all to send anything in. Um, the, the last thing, John, I'll plug uh, for all the trainees out there, if they're interested in learning more about phlegmasia, this article, it's, it's nine years old, but I think it lays out sort of the thought process to phlegmasia and sort of the presentation pretty nicely. So I, I suggest taking a look at it and also the, the outcomes of some of the more severe patients with venous gain green and those sort of things. And I think it's a, a good educational article. Before we move on, let me just ask, uh, Kathy, what would be your follow-up regimen for someone in this situation getting uh, acute DVT and then stenting? How do you follow them and yeah. for their, their stent? Right, right. So um, we usually get them in a compression stocking um, before they leave the hospital. And our hospital mostly has TED hosts, which are not the same thing. So we actually uh, have a family member or whatnot get a real stocking, you know, at the at a medical supply store that we show them how to put on when they leave. Um, Cause usually they still have some residual edema. Then we see them uh, a week usually after they've been in the hospital and we'll do a, a clinical evaluation. We will often do a follow-up duplex at that time if it's an iliofemoral DVT and we look at their stent if they've had a stent. Um, and then we will see them uh, at three months and reevaluate and then um, go from after that it's not su subscribed any particular time but most iliofemoral dvts unless it's a provoked event like after an orthopedic procedure we oftentimes will have these people on indefinite extended dose anticoagulation for a event like this um you know particularly if this person had cancer and then we see people every six to 12 months when they're on chronic anticoagulation eventually once a year and um, in our community, we're the ones doing that. Um, we have a DVT clinic rather than their primary care doctor. Right. right. Uh, there's a question from the audience. Uh, 
I'll ask, I guess, you know, quickly, uh, all four of you, including you, John, uh, do you do do you give Lovinox on table or wait for hemostasis? John. I'll start. I mean, Regu, um, we give it on the table, and that's even if we give lytics, and that's even with, uh, I think you used an Inari, that's a that's a reasonably large, not a, it's a 14 French uh, sheath in the pop. It's no no problem. You just got to be absolutely perfect with your access, obviously, but no problem with that at all on the table. Yeah, I think it's important to be really aggressive with your anticoagulation because if you, it's easy to, for gaps to develop and you think they're going to get it, they don't get it, and you find that you've got everything's thrombosed three hours later while they're still waiting for their first shot of the uh, Lovinox. Yeah, agree. Happy. Yeah, we give IV heparin, um, you know, when we're doing a case and uh, the only person I've ever had a complication in actually wasn't an acute, it was a chronic where I was doing a mid-thigh access, case went well, and um, this speaks to the be very careful with your access is I had a uh, couple goes to get in and she developed a fistula and then, you know, because I'd hit the artery and, and hadn't noticed um, and then later got a big hematoma in her thigh. So I've had one, you know, out of every one that I've done where I've had one person she needed a transfusion. Um, in all the vein cases I've done, usually veins do very well. They're much more forgiving than uh, misadventures in arteries. So if you avoid the arteries, you'll probably be fine. Cool. All right. Um, any other questions um, um, uh, or any other pointers uh, uh, from the panel? Let me ask you one question. Uh, um, when when we started out uh, vein program in Illinois, we we used to put uh, uh, calf pumps in all of these patients, uh, at least overnight, but this was, you know, the overnight lysis and those type of situations. Uh, do you do any of that or same day discharge, next day discharge? Or what, what do you, how do you, how do you treat these patients? Yeah. John, I'll let you start. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, whatever Ramsey was gonna say is what we do. So Ramsey, <laughs> okay, you okay, go ahead, Ramsey, go ahead. <laughs> So what John and I do, <laughs> um, Lovenox on the table, uh, SCD is while in bed is typically what we do. So if they're in bed and then encourage er early ambulation is kind of the big thing is try to get them out of bed uh, that night as early as possible, walking around just to use the natural pump. And then, but while they're in bed, we do still do SCDs on. Um, I had another patient uh, just this past week that had some pain um, in the popliteal fossa afterwards and was not ambulating very well. So a case like that uh, is particularly important, I think, to, to help them with the pump to have the SCDs on. But early ambulations uh, is our big focus. Excellent. Well, thank you, um, Ramsey. Thank you very much. Uh, I will we'll move on to the second case. Um, now we're done with the acute case. We're moving on to um, a chronic occlusion, um, uh, and uh, Mike Jolly, one of my partners here um, at Ohio Health, is uh, going to talk about uh, his next case. Mike, uh, can you tell us your background a bit, and you know, uh, and take away, take it away with sure. the case here? So thanks, uh, thanks for having me. So um, I'm an interventional cardiologist, and the interesting thing, and the big misnomer in the American Board of Internal Medicine is that. On my cardiology diploma, it says cardiovascular medicine. It's very interesting because I had very limited vascular training, like probably 90% of all cardiologists in the country. Um, so we've kept the designation cardiovascular medicine. Um, but hey, look, I mean, uh, I did a lot of peripheral interventional training, so I, I probably had more than most. But uh, most of my uh, hardcore vascular training has been done on the job with Raigu as a mentor and several others. And uh, what, I, what I recognized in my first few years of practice is that there's a whole world um, in the venous world, I mean, uh, it, much, to, much to my dismay and maybe so much, uh, I'm losing some of my cardiology because of how, how prevalent the venous uh, condition is. So um, there's a lot of disease out there. There's, there's a lot of ways to uh, tackle it. There's a lot of specialties that are important in taking care of this disease. So for me, it was a need in our, in our hospital, which got me into, you know, uh, Venus specifically, but uh, it's been very rewarding. And so that's kind of my background. I still, uh, I'm still an interventional cardiologist by day sometimes. I'm going to talk about post-thrombotic syndrome and, and to some degree venous leg ulcers, but we're going to focus on post-thrombotic syndrome. 
So let me get control of it here. So this is an interesting case, actually, a fantastically interesting case, I think. Um, 77 year old guy, he, he kind of strolls in uh, to see actually Dr. Kalori, his ulcerative colitis. He has a very remote history of colon cancer, kind of the standard risk factors, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and unfortunately he has chronic kidney disease. So he's been um, in and out of venous, you know, kind of wound care centers for two years. And when you take a history, he says, look, I had ulcerative colitis way back in my thirties. This was in the seventies. Um, and they took out my colon um, because they thought I had colon cancer by very minimum. Remember there's no CAT scans at that time. So he under went hemicolectomy. Um, and apparently he may have had a DVT at that time. So fast forward 20, 25 years, and he's, he's developed these venous leg ulcers. And like I said, he's been in and out of wound care. He says he's had edema forever, um, and they've just never healed. So finally, someone kind of sent him to Ragu and said, look, what, what can you do? Can you ablate this guy? What can we do? Interestingly, as I mentioned, his creatinine is high. So when you do a physical exam on him, these are this is his, uh, this is his left leg, your left, you know, in, your medial and your lateral uh, ulcers. So... Let me ask you, what would you do in the next part of his workup? A, would you do a hypercoagulable panel? Would you scan him for venous insufficiency? Would you maybe put a little bit tighter compression wraps on him? He's been in compression wraps, but you know, is he wearing them? Um, would you go to CT venography? Um, his creatinine's high. Um, or is this just arterial disease? Would you do an ABI on arterial duplex? Where would you go here? So we have a venous insufficiency duplex and CT venography. So those are, we're, we're split halfway. Uh, well, let's see what Regu did, because actually this is his. And there may not be a right answer here. So he did a venous insufficiency duplex, a formal kind of scan, you know, not your standard check for DVT, but let's check for reflux. And, and we kind of do a pictogram here. And as you can see, um, he has significant GSV reflux bilaterally. He has anterior accessory reflux bilaterally. And it is noted he has deep venous reflux as well bilaterally. So that's, that's the thing. So now we got our data back. He's coming back to see Ragu and he's talking about what would you do? Would you ablate his GSV? After all, he has pretty significant ulcers, maybe some foam sclerotherapy. Would you still do some axial imaging of some form or is this just a red herring? Is this ABI? Is this arterial disease? Where, what would you guys like to do next? So we're split equally again. This is a great case. Um, and, and by the way, there may or may not be a right answer here, but, um, but I think the deep venous reflux uh, did trigger something in Ragu's mind. I don't want to speak for you, Ragu, but um, this tends to be, you know, he has really extensive and, and kind of progressed um, ulcers. So for us, we did a CT venography. So look at the CT venogram. It plays pretty fast. Maybe some people caught it. This is a non-contrast. This is a non-contrast study. You know, you got to take what you get. The patient, you know, our radiologist didn't feel comfortable scanning this guy. So this is a non-contrast CT, as it says on the screen. I'll let it play one more time. And just shout it out, everyone, if you know what that is. Well, if you don't know what that is, neither did, neither did the radiologist. Um, and um, for some reason, the image has just disappeared from my slide here. Um, but Mike, the radiologist just said there was a... It is. Hey, Mike, before you tell people what the thing is, yeah. You see that much calcium in the arteries, in the veins? The, yeah. Does that dissuade you from getting involved? Uh, calcium is always something you take into consideration. Um, and he's talking about this right here. It has a great pickup. And I actually have a slide later that demonstrates this. Profound venous cal calcification. Flibolids, yeah. Yeah, yeah fl a bit more than long, just a normal flibolids. Long flibolids, yeah. This is a stone wall of flebolis, and it was something that was picked up. And um, did it dissuade me? Well, no. I mean, calcium is always the enemy of any certainly endovascular approach, which is what I offer. But um, the other thing I would note on the CT, just notice all the collaterals and the abdominal wall. So, um, so, and when I go to my next slide, for some reason, I have just disappeared. The image has disappeared. But what I wanted to show you was a. Uh, did you see? I don't know. Is yeah, you can, maybe you can stop it. When you get I'll to just it. stop it. Yeah. He swallowed a barrette. Just pause it. He <laughs> swallowed a barrette. That's exactly right. So this is the slide that the next yeah. one has to be. So yeah. the radiologist uh, was not too curious about it because he said there was just a, a clamp on the IVC. I guess that's something they see all the time. So, um, is it, you're, you know, <laughs> Ramsey, you're a radiologist. Is that something? <laughs> so anyway, I thought that was interesting. But, but um, 
I'm going to detour with a quick history lesson. So, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, it was recognized, it was starting to be recognized that, you know, DVTs were a bad thing. They led to PEs and people were dying. So, uh, obviously, you just sew off the IVC and you you protect people from having PEs. And, 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 that, and frankly, it did work pretty well. But downstream, of course, patients would have problems. And so, in, and I think it was in the 60s, Adams and DeWeese at the University of Rochester came up with a way to, what about just partially interrupting the cava? So they basically developed this plastic chip clip, because that's what it looks like. And it's, they sew it with a suture onto the vena cava. No big DVT is going to get through that thing that's going to cause any intraoperative catastrophe. And that's what they did for some time. That's what this guy had. And, and actually, it just took a modicum of curiosity to kind of take a little bit of a history. And then as Ragu kind of prompted this guy you could read in his note as i was reading in preparation for this the guy's like oh yeah they did some weird clip on my ivies you know he hadn't thought about it for 40 years so so that leads us to, to this what do you do now do you send him to a surgeon for ilio cable bypass surgery do you do a gsv ablation uh uh, we can't really do anything here. We got a clip here. Do we try to do something crazy endovascularly or do we maybe he needs a skin graft down there and some GSV ablation? Let's go with that. So, of course, I've given this away, but, uh, I've, you know, I'm a hammer and I see a nail. So um, that's what we chose, endovascular iliac cable reconstruction. So there is a precedent for this. Um, and. That was exactly what we, taught, we thought to do here. Um, so just, uh, John, what you had mentioned, if you were to look at this fluoro fluoroscopic image, which I saved here, this is, a, this is a person, if you're doing an arterial procedure, you're going to be really careful about where you go in the artery because look at all this calcium. I mean, this is a, just an absolute uh, you know, roadblock of calcium. But as you mentioned on the CT scan, this was not arterial. This is purely venous. So um, venous flebolis. So this patient's creatinine was bad, so this was a CO2 case. And I just assumed, because I had no kind of functional assessment of flow uh, going into this case, that it would all just be occluded. Well, it turns out the adams Deweese clip has worked quite well for 40-some-odd years, and there actually is flow. Now, it's functionally occluded, CABA, but you can still see the iliac veins have CO2, which is very, very low viscosity, so you can't read too much into it, but it is patent. So that was interesting. So um, here's the Deweese clip in a full lateral projection. You can see the shadow of it here in a lateral projection. You can also see all that dense calcification. So let's just try to cross this. So here's a wire. We're kind of, a, this is a glide wire and it went somewhere. So did we go through it? We go into a lateral projection and sure enough, we went through it and we check with an ultrasound with an IVUS uh, and IVUS does demonstrate that we went straight to the middle of it. So not only was it patent, but it was actually able to be easily crossed with a, with a guide wire. And then it just comes down to rupturing the suture. So we started kind of low with a 12 and 18. You can still see it's just, it's just holding on, holding on, holding on until we got to about 20, millimeters of a balloon and then it just kind of popped and you can kind of see the uh the the waist clip the uh, suture popped open and then in a lateral projection you can kind of see now the wire here the guide wire is out of the confines of the deweese clip so we know we have broken the clip so now it's just a matter of doing our standard endovascular reconstruction this was in the era of us using wall stents this is prior to there being venous stents so we're using wall stents and reconstructing the iliocable segments um and getting our uh you know, getting a, and there's one shot of dye we did, we did use because I really wanted to see what this looked like. And you have reasonably good efflux of dye out of the system. Uh, all the collaterals, which are, of course, still there, they're no longer uh, filling, which is a good thing. Um, we used 40 cc's of dye. Now, this is a point in case. I mean, here's a guy. We didn't actually put him on Eliquis. Um, I'm sorry, uh, um, Lobinox, he refused to take it. So we went straight to Clopidogrel and Apixaban on him. Uh, he comes back, you know, one month and everything looked great. But more importantly, you know, remember, this was his pre-procedure right foot. Uh, these wide open ulcers, uh, you know, at whatever this was, six months or so, they're looking quite good. And then at eight months, you know, they've almost totally healed, as you can see here. And same on the left, you know, left was uh, looking like this and then and finally um, nearly fully closed. So a really nice demonstration of um, really getting to the root cause when you see venous ulcerations that are this pronounced and severe, you need to think a little bit outside the box and spend as much time as you need to take a good history because this history dated back to the 70s, uh, which really was the case clincher. And, and you have to have uh, a high index of suspicion for stuff because IVC filters are so rampant in the United States and patients just do not remember they were ever put in. Um, so you've got to sniff these things out, uh, use axial imaging, even without dye, you can get a lot of great images. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. 
<clears throat> Any questions uh, for Dr. for for Michael? Uh, this this was a really really interesting case. Um, um, yeah, Any no. questions? Uh, yeah, just I guess one comment and then questions. The, the reason why I asked about the calcium is that sometimes it's just this thread of calcium and nothing, and uh, that doesn't stop us. We'll go ahead and try and reconstruct that if the patient clinically needs it. So yeah, John, um, uh, honestly, um, besides seeing it, uh, the, 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 the case went like any other case we didn't even know it was there. And it's, you know, in the arteries, you have, you know, cause sometimes you can't open the vessels, not the case with the vein. These all opened very nicely. And, and it was as if there was no calcium there. All right, folks, there is a question from the audience here. How do you avoid uh, stent migration for the, First proximal stent, especially wall stent. Yeah, Dr. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a really good question. I, this might have been the case where I learned a lesson on um, this where the calcium did play a role. You know, wall stents, it's a whole lecture on its own because there is a science and maybe an art to some degree of deploying wall stents. And I don't know if it was this case or a different one, but one thing about landing a wall stent, um, it does take a little bit of, of learning. There's a learning curve to it. Um, Landing um, IVC wall stents, I've actually started to uh, change the way I do it. So um, instead of landing, this one I landed at the top, there has been cases where I've landed at the renal veins and brought it down, but I ballooned at the renal vein first, the top of the wall stent. I don't actually do that too much anymore. And the reason is if you're stenting a totally occluded uh, IVC, what happens is as you start to balloon the top of the wall stent, the bottom of it pulls up, you know, it slinkies. And then as it relaxes, instead of relaxing back down, if it's still basically occluded on there, it'll just push the top up and you'll actually walk a stent up the IVC. So there are some interesting things with the, with the cave that you have to be careful with. So I tend to balloon the bottom of the wall stents now if I'm sending a cave. In the United States, uh, the wall stent is still the biggest stent besides the, maybe a Z stent that we have for cable stenting. So it becomes relevant. I have a question oh, for uh, Kathy. So when you're done with these chronic cases, you do that injection that Mike showed, you'll, you want, you're looking for a washout or another problem. What do you like to see on that that makes you feel like you're gonna get a durable outcome? Or are there, the other thing is, is there something you might see that's gonna make you- uh, Yeah, that? absence of collaterals for sure. Yeah, I mean, cause it's all hemodynamics. So if, it, if there's resistance, it will go, it goes, the, the, the contrast goes in the path of least resistance. So if you're still seeing a lot of collaterals, um, you know, Ivis is your friend, try to figure out what's going on. Um, and the one thing that often, um, we see it a little less now with the dedicated stents, but when we do, you know, rebuilding of the whole bifurcation, you have to be careful with the wall stents and the double barrel, because sometimes you'll have a winner and a loser wall stent, and you need to make sure that you're not getting, you know, one that's dominant crushing the other one. And so, you do really have to be pretty meticulous in looking afterwards that the flow is good and the collaterals are gone and that you don't have a stent uh, intruding on the domain of another stent. Although with the dedicated stents now, we have less problem with that. Yeah, Mike, do you sometimes we'll see contrast kind of layering up in the iliac portion, particularly on the left. Yeah. What do you think when you see that? And do you, do you worry about that? Absolutely. You should really, so there's several things. Most of our patients for these procedures are, are supine. So we don't get some of the issues we get with a prone patient, but um, stagnant dye, I don't, I don't care how anticoagulated they are. You cannot have stagnant dye. You have to have washout. You don't want to see a lot of layering. Um, and there's a couple other things. You, you definitely don't want to see collaterals. You also don't want to cheat. And a lot of times the tip of your sheath is right at the beginning of your stents. So as you forcefully inject, uh, you're just pushing it out. What you really want to inject from is a little bit lower on. You want to see if you have enough inflow to your stents to carry that dye out of your stent. You want to see if there's enough native flow. It's even better when you can do it retrograde because then you can see if the dye is actually pushed backwards at you. So there's little things like that you do. Um, obviously the, the hardest part of these cases is the inflow, you know, because these are all post-thrombotic and the, the, the post-thrombotic syndrome doesn't just start, stop at the common femoral vein, right? It's usually a disaster. So you have to find reasonable inflow to sustain, uh, to sustain the stent. So all these things go into it. If you see dye hang up, you have to explain it. You have to go back in through IVIS. You check your inflow, you check your outflow, you check your stent apposition and expansion. All those things uh, are relevant factors. Kathy, uh, thanks, Michael. Um, uh, Kathy, quick question um, um, and, you know, simple answer uh, for 
one of Michael's questions, and then I have an audience question after that, right after that, and then we'll go to your case. Would you, in your career, um, you know, have you seen um, the, uh, any vein surgical procedures for um, uh, uh, lesion like this? Ilio, um, uh, yeah, I haven't done a bypass. No, I haven't done a bypass. I've taken a clip off before um, surgically, and it's actually not that hard to do. You know, it's not that hard to find them. Okay. You can do them and take them off. You know, obviously this approach is better than doing surgery. So the one we took off, that was years ago, we took it off. And then um, I think it was like 15 years ago. And that was before I was doing much deep venous reconstruction. And then our interventional radiology colleagues did a stent later um, and we removed okay. it. Now I would do exactly okay. what Mike, Michael did. Okay. So th thank you. Next question is, um, how was the wound after this intervention? Um, I think you showed the healing. Do, uh, Michael, do you want to elaborate? And then the other question is, how do you monitor uh, healing? Yeah, so he stayed uh, plugged into the vein center. And um, the, the real question that I had was, listen, Raghu, I've done this. Do you want to ablate his uh, superficial venous system now to kind of expedite things? And it turns out um, the guy was <laughs> – He's kind of a weird dude, honestly, but he stayed with multi-layer compression wraps um, and like he didn't heal the next day, right? It still took time. My part was done. My part was honestly the easy part. My part took three hours. Um, it, he was still in and out of the wound care center. They kept measuring it every single day. It was closing. Cl and as long as he was progressing and look, I told you it took him eight months to really get there, but he got there and he has not reopened. So, and he still has profound venous insufficiency in all of his superficial and his deep system really as well. So, but this is a guy with, he healed with multilayer compression without needing a vein ablation. And, and then he stayed healed with just continued compression throughout the rest of his life. Yeah. I mean, that's such a critical point. It is not just the intervention. There's a lot of follow-up on these patients and you have to stay involved and stay committed to them uh, for basically uh, their life because uh, these recurrences can occur at almost any time. So great, great discussion. Uh, there's a question about this being recorded. Yes, it is being recorded and you'll be able to access this on the Aviva website uh, afterwards. I think at this point, we're gonna move on to our, our last case. Dr. Kathy Gibson, uh, we're pleased to have you here. and. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, reintroduce yourself and, and do your case. Yeah, I'm uh, Kathleen Gibson and I'm a vascular surgeon in the Seattle area. So we're switching gears a little bit to a more superficial venous topic and um, kind of a complex case in a elderly patient. Is there some disclosures? And so this patient was 87 year old woman. Uh, she'd had a long history of varicose veins and had uh, bilateral ulcerations. We're gonna focus on the right leg though, cause it was worse laterally and medially. Uh, she had significant edema and pain. She found compression wraps very difficult to wear. She had somebody that would come in and help her with them but uh, they were quite painful. Um, she also had severe arthritis in her uh, back and in her hands, such that she would sleep kind of in a reclining chair. She couldn't sleep in a bed because of her severe kyphosis. Um, she had a history of right-sided heart failure. She had atrial fibrillation. She's chronically anticoagulated and she um, walks around her house with a walker, but otherwise is wheelchair bound and has a, is a chronic pain patient. So risk factors, she has varicose vein, she has heart failure, and she uh, has her limbs dependent much of the day. So uh, in this picture, she has medially this scaly, painful uh, area. Uh, she, you can see some varicosities across her shin here. The varicose veins, because she's not standing, are not so obvious, but here you can kind of see them also. And they go over to this area of ulceration, which originally probably was a skin tear. Uh, but is not healing. And both of these are extremely painful. She's got a wrap on her other leg here. Uh, she felt that her life was, uh, quality of life was poor enough that she was considering palliative care services um, and was quite depressed. So this is her duplex imaging. Uh, these are the superficial images. Her uh, GSVs are incompetent bilaterally. She did have some branches, which you can't see well in this picture that go over to kind of across her shin. 
SSV has one little area here, but that's just from a branch coming in and out. And on her other side, she's got an incompetent GSV as well. And her SSVs look competent bilaterally. This is a- And the deep, and the deep system was Deep system competent. shows, no, uh, shows uh, mild reflux. Both uh, sides, this is showing left common femoral, but both sides have this waveform, which is gonna lead to our next question in the deep system. She has no obstructive lesions, including in her iliacs, which we did study as well. And we, in our institution, we tend to do, start with iliac ultrasound. Um, we reserve uh, cross-sectional imaging if we can't see well. So this was the image, and this is gonna go to the next poll question. And we're gonna talk about what does this waveform mean? So uh, poll question number one, what do you think when you see this? Arterial venous malformation, central venous obstruction. Oh, I gave it away. I said that it's not that one because I told you we looked at that. Deep venous reflux, elevated right heart pressure, or a siphon effect from an incompetent GSV. Okay. And that's uh, the, most people said elevated right heart pressure. Does the, anyone on the panel want to comment? Raghu? Yeah, so uh, elevated central venous pressure, um, um, sort of a pet peeve of mine. That's the reason Kathy is uh, uh, calling me out here. We had our publication uh, in Journal of Vascular Surgery um, I, th I believe in January, um, the, the prevalence of uh, central venous pressure elevation in patients presenting to our uh, institution um, was 22% um, in all, all uh, patients presenting with venous insufficiency. Um, the, the pulsatile flow um, was seen only in 3% of the patients, but it's very, very specific once you find it that, you know, uh, uh, there's something wrong uh, with the uh, with that uh, uh, right atrium, so um, so uh, that that should raise a red flag there for sure about overall management of the patient. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, you'll see uh, patients like these when you put the uh, radio frequency or a laser catheter. I think. Uh, Kathy, I shared one of those videos with you uh, where the catheter will keep doing this and in the vein, almost like an artery. So um, uh, sometimes you're forced to do uh, procedures in these patients because you have exhausted uh, all of the uh, measures, but you got to make sure that, you know, you think about these other things and, you know, that those plumbing things are uh, attached to the pump. Hey, okay, good. All right. Well, let's just kind of jump in real fast, Kathy. Yeah. Um, the pulsatility is a reflection of tricuspid uh, insufficiency. And so historically in cardiology, that was the, the tricuspid valve, maybe the pulmonic valve was just kind of the last. No one really cares about it. Don't worry about it. Patients get really sick with severe TR. And we have treatments for this now. We can clip the tricuspid valve. We can even replace some tricuspid valves, in, you know, percutaneously. Like this is a lady you're not going to send for open heart surgery, but you could actually – clip her valve with the, the same apparatus they use for mitral clip. And um, if that's the sole etiology of her symptoms, so it's just worth keeping that in mind. There are treatments now that didn't exist 10 years ago. Hey, Raghu, could you just, you know, considering our audience, what would you have expected if it, there was an AVF or AVM on that, arc, on that waveform? So the, the, the uh, depends on where the um, uh, AVF, uh, arteriovit fistula is, right? Uh, John, depends on um, whether it's proximal to it or distal to it. Um, if, we were, if we're thinking that it's um, distal, meaning caudad, uh, uh, in veins, we should, you know, what is, the, what is proximal to arteries is opposite, of, uh, opposite for veins. So if you think that the AVF is caudad to where we're insinating, then you should have the direction of flow, the arterial type of flow going toward the heart. Um, whereas the pulsatility that you see here is more consistent. Obviously it, with uh, AVFs, you will see it, you know, on the side of the AVF and not on the other side. You know, uh, I had a lot of uh, farmers uh, when I was practicing in Illinois and 
uh, the hog farmers used to have it all the time uh, because, you know, the pigs bumped into their <laughs> their calves and, you know, they set off these uh, traumatic AVFs. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, so here's what my concerns were. Um, so I kind of had to think a long time about what to do with this lady. So she's got heart failure, clearly. And uh, my concern was if I treated her superficial veins, I may make her no better if this is predominantly heart failure. She had tenuous volume status. Uh, you know, normally we don't think about tumescent anesthesia being an issue uh, for people. However, years ago, I did send one woman to the ICU uh, who had pulmonary hypertension and the, you know, she was cleared by her pulmonologist and we did uh, an ablation and the amount of volume we used for tumescent sent her to the unit. Um, so you have to be thinking of these things. This woman cannot lay flat. Uh, she cannot frog leg, she's fused. She's fully anticoagulated. She's got very thin skin. Um, and she's not very tolerant of pain and does not tolerate compression well. So I asked myself, should I really be doing anything at all or should I be calling the palliative medicine service? So um, this gets to our next poll question. What would you do? So local wound care and compression only, local wound care compression and diuresis slash medical management, local wound care, compression, endothermal ablation, assuming the medical management occurs also, local wound care, compression, and non-thermal ablation, or local wound care, compression, and limited phlebectomy of the periulcer veins. Okay, very, very split, very split. Um, and what I did do, and uh, this is, I think, an area where endothermal ablation uh, is not as ideal. Um, this is a woman with this mixed picture of edema and wounds. I treated her sitting. Um, and this was uncomfortable for me, but comfortable for her. So we had a, uh, we kind of beach chaired our table. So she sat, it took us longer to position her than it did the case. And I used venous seal. Um, that way I did not have to use any tumescent and I did sclerotherapy in the ulcer bed and treated her veins in a staged fashion, one at a time, just because there wasn't a lot that she would tolerate. Um, so this was a fast procedure involving no tumescent. So this is showing I treated the proximal uh, GSV and sclerotherapy. Then we did dress her. She had local uh, care to the ulcer. We got her ambulating right away and interestingly, her severe pain with wraps was better by the two week visit and she was much better at tolerating her dressing changes. And we were able to transition her to a 10 to 20 millimeter stocking because her caregiver could not put on a 20 to 30 stocking. And she, uh, for whatever reason, did not want to circade, but that might've been another option. So this is her picture at three months. Um, you can see that she's got a little new skin tear that's very shallow, but dramatically less edema. And my favorite part of this picture actually is that she's wearing a skirt uh, because she would come to our clinic with the same pair of dirty um, sweatpants every time. You know, she was depressed, unhappy, didn't really want to live much, and she's wearing a nice skirt to this visit. So her mood also uh, appreciably increased. So this was a bit of a gamble. I wasn't sure that this was the right thing to do, but it, it paid off for her. So um, I welcome any kind of commentary or questions from either the audience or the rest of the panel. Yeah, you know, great case. I think it really points out how you need to think about the whole patient, right? And, that, and that's kind of what I'm hearing from your evaluation of her. I mean, this, it might have been easy to just kind of pass her along to palliative care, but you really thought about the whole patient and all the different technologies and you came up with a, a great solution. And that is, it's dramatic how much people's lives will improve, right, sometimes. And yet, it, this, the venous disease gets very overlook, overlooked as a significant uh, component of, of what's making them feel bad. So, um, What's going to happen to her heart? Yeah, exactly. Uh, 
Good question. So, you know, she has a very involved cardiologist. I, he hasn't mentioned anything about the clipping. Maybe next I see him, I'll, I'll mention that to him. Uh, but, you know, the, the one thing that was hard to tell in this kind of taking care of the vein problem helped is we really, it was difficult to tell how much of this was venous versus cardiac. And, um, you know, it was both. But, uh, you know, I think her, the main thing is her life now is um, quality of life is better and she's kind of okay. She's tooling along on her uh, Coumadin and her cardiac meds. So she'd be 89 now. I haven't seen her in at least a year. Cool. <clears throat> Very cool. Um, let's see, a quick question popped up uh, with uh, the great Dr. Lowell Kadnick. Was the patient optimized with the right heart uh, sided failure prior to intervention? Would that have made a difference? Uh, yes, we did. We did do that. And in fact, kind of during her wound care and all of that, I was in close contact with her cardiologist because um, I also wanted to know what she would and would not tolerate. So we kind of did things in conjunction. I think that's key. Um, uh, I, I will uh, monitor, you know, their ND pro BNPs and, you know, see how uh, they're doing, if that is elevated uh, with the diuretics, you know, make sure. The nice thing for us, uh, we're um, behind Michael, you see that uh, building there on the top floor is our wound center, and right next to the wound center is um, is the heart failure center, so it actually works out really good for us, and uh, there's this new evidence, uh, or at least a hypothesis of uh, hef puff connection with iliac uh, um, uh, vein and IVC obstruction due to the lack of return and how patient symptoms are improving after, you know, reopening their IVC in a situation like Michael had uh, uh, demonstrated. You, we all see that, uh, you know, how the patients say, oh, wow, I started feeling uh, better and breathing better too. Uh, so, you know, it's, that's something uh, we need to look into as well um, as a cause and effect uh, or at least an association and, you know, make that uh, a formal association. So a lot, lot more work to do uh, on the Venus end. Um, any other questions? Yeah. <clears throat> Rangu, I've got a question for you. Maybe you answered this when you were talking about your paper, uh, but, you know, again, uh, all patients who walk in the door with swollen legs and varicose veins don't have just varicose veins, as, as this case really beautifully shows. When do you get really worried about the heart? You know, you, you mentioned you found it in a certain percentage, but I'm not sure you said what are the clinical clues, the uh, historical clues that are going to make you dig a little deeper in these patients? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, again, history is very uh, important. Uh, in this paper, John, <clears throat> we noted uh, that... Uh, um, the uh, the percent of people with obstructive sleep apnea in this cohort was 27 <laughs> percent. So uh, a fourth of them, you know, uh, had obstructive sleep apnea. And for those who did not have obstructive sleep apnea, we also got stop bang scores that gives the uh, um, it, that categorizes the risk for sleep apnea as uh, mild risk, moderate risk, or high risk. And when you combine the folks who had sleep apnea and who are at high risk for sleep apnea, that's close to 45%. So I take all of that history, sleep apnea and your know, elevated right heart function as associated with that, um, you know, history about, you know, uh, shortness of breath or not feeling well, you know, those type of things. Um, uh, um, and, and any history of congestive heart failure, whether it's right or left, obviously, I want to look at, you know, the echocardiogram and my threshold for asking someone like Mike to do a right heart cath is quite low. If I see pulsed outflow and if I ordered an echocardiogram, if it comes, you know, as normal, I'm like, just like Mike was complaining about radiologists missing a Deweese clip, I complain about cardiologists missing, you know, uh, uh, tricuspid regurg or elevated central pressure. So I, I'm, I'm, I work and, you know, I send 
I send a lot of my patients to sleep studies. Anecdotally, you know, almost 70 to 80 percent of them have improved, uh, you know, leg symptoms. Um, not, you know, formally uh, followed or published that yet. Uh, but, you know, I think all of those things, like you said earlier, uh, like Kathy did, you got to see the patient as a whole, you know, I mean, uh, there are all these other systemic issues that, you know, eventually increase the intravenous uh, pressure. Real fast to follow up on that, Regu, you make a good point because as I mentioned, you know, the tricuspid, the least interesting part of the echo go for most, most radiologists. Honestly, it's the thing um, that's actually replaced. So a lot of the studies are um, borderline in, in terms of lateness when it comes to the, the function of the tricuspid valve and estimation of the pulmonary artery pr pressure. The estimated artery pressure purely of tricuspid regurgitation. And that means the echo uh, tech has to see tricuspid regurgitation or have a nice jet to insinate in order to, ca to make that calculation. So sure. if you yeah. see pulsatility, the first thing you should probably do is look back at the last echo. If they don't have one, then get one. Uh, and then see what yes. their PA pressure is. And if it, it sometimes they'll say unable to estimate because, no, you know, whatever. So that would push you to maybe either repeat it, put in the comments, I really need this. Or, yeah. Right heart cath, right easy. So um, all of those things should be high on your index of suspicion. You made that point. Excellent. Okay, well. John, um, we are uh, at the end uh, of the one hour webinar here. Um, I think, uh, uh, unless, do you have any other questions? Anyone panel, any comments, um, pearls of wisdom that each one of you would like to give the fellows? and training. Ramsey, why don't you start? Um, yeah, I think Happy kind of, keep learning. one of the things that we've highlighted is, you know, someone who's three years out of training is there's a lot of learning in these patients um, and working with a lot of people uh, across multiple disciplines in situations like this uh, is really important because I think whatever background you come from, there's a lot to learn from your colleagues. So keep an open mind. Yeah, I agree. As a, as someone coming in with very limited Venus stuff, is kind of fine. You know, they've always said this. I heard this all throughout training. I just kind of rolled my eyes. And it's true. Um, when you look for practices, you want to find someone who who can be a mentor. That doesn't mean they have to know everything, but they can help you uh, because you're going to differentiate yourself. And I'll tell you, the Venus disease stuff. I never saw this as being something that I would start uh, uh, being a niche for me. But um, it was totally overlooked in training, at least in a cardiology fellowship. Certainly as an internal medicine fellowship, uh, cardi uh, residency, um, and it's so prevalent and so overlooked and the patient like Kathy presented that's what we see all the time this is a patient that was absolutely miserable and I will tell you and I tell this story all the time I will take care of someone with the STEMI who's dying and CPR and cardiogenic shock they walk out of the hospital but I don't even get a thank but to someone like that patient you truly change their life a wake-up call for me so um, you, you actually get a help meaningful way I mean living in a wound care center must be pretty miserable because these patients come into your office crying when you when you get them out of it all right. Well, great. Thank you, guys. Um, we'll uh, uh, close the webinar. Thanks, everyone, uh, for attending. Um, and uh, make sure uh, to um, uh, uh, sign up for the next uh, uh, Viva Strategies on the front line. It is the aortic interventions. It's on June 4th. Go to sign up at vivaphysicians.org. Um, we, uh, we have mentioned this before. This uh, will be recorded and should be available on the Viva website very soon. Uh, with that, um, have a good evening. Stay safe. Thank you. Great cases, everyone. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks for Thank you. participating.